Hello, everyone, um, and uh, let's start your uh, Sierra. So welcome uh, one and all for yet another session on doing business in uh, United States. So part two, big, we have seen in the last week, uh, we gave a brief overview about uh, how about US and uh, certain um, uh, key things uh, like the various types of constitution and uh, a high level uh, discussion on the tax piece and the pros and cons uh, some again we touched upon uh, sales tax as well today uh, we'll be uh, dealing into some specific aspects like uh, transfer pricing totalization agreement and a cfc will touch base, up, touch base upon what are the provisions in us tax laws or in us laws for uh, uh, avoidance of tax uh, and a few more other things. So let's get started, friend. Again, introducing Joe and Sierra, who will be taking us uh, uh, for today's session. And um, it'll be again like last time, a, a hour and a hour, 15 minute session uh, today as well. So over to you, Joe. You go. Thank you so much. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Joe Hillstead, like Jugal mentioned, very, very glad to be here. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Sierra Hoggett. She's, uh, she's fantastic. Special thanks to her for all her help and special thanks to Jugal, his team and DVS advisors for sponsoring uh, this webinar. Uh, very, very, very glad to be here. And thanks everyone for taking the time where, wherever you are, it may be late or early. Um, so re really appreciate your time. Hopefully uh, you, you get some things out of today's webinar talking about our second uh, uh, second session of doing business in the United States. Um, again, I'm Joe Hillstead. I'm a tax partner with Squire and Company located in Salt Lake City, Utah in, in the Mountain West of the United States. So wh why don't we dive into it? Um, I think uh, I think that I've got the ability to to go into the slide. So let's see here. Well, here, yeah, here's the agenda that that uh, Sierra and I talked about, and Jugal already mentioned it. We want to talk about uh, payroll taxes in the United States. Uh, want to have a discussion about uh, the U.S. transfer pricing regime, right? Any intercompany transactions. You know, we talk about intercompany transactions in terms of you know, if we've got maybe an Indian parent that sells inventory to the United States or maybe pro provides valuable management services like strategy or general management or C-suite services or uh, accounting, legal, HR, uh, software, things like that. Uh, you know, other licensing of, of intellectual property. We want to cover that. Uh, the next one we want to cover is a, a regime that's relatively new to the U.S. tax landscape. That's an acronym called GILTI. Um, that stands for Global Intangible Low Taxed Income. Uh, and that's a, applicable to um, subsidiaries of a U.S. entity. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about another acronym, BEAT, B-E-A-T. Uh, we'll get into that. That's applicable when we've got certain intercompany transaction. And then Sierra is going to touch on the last point, and that is related to what's called the CARES Act. Uh, that's an, an, some new tax legislation that came as a direct result of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, which here in the United States has claimed the lives of of more than 400,000 people, unfortunately. And so there's been some, some business and tax legislation to help small businesses that are struggling as a result of this, this, this terrible pandemic that we're going through. So that, that's the agenda for, for today. Let, let's go and recap, and just a reminder of some of the things that we talked about last time. Last time we talked about an, a general overview of uh, you know of the United States, the population, some of the larger states by population. Uh, talked about where where Sierra and I live in the in the Mountain West in Utah, in the in the beautiful mountains. It's January here. It's very cold. There's snow in the mountains. So if you uh, 
you'd like to come skiing in Utah, you now have friends here. So come, come visit us. We talked about, uh, you know, we talked about financial statement audit requirements. You may recall last time, right, in the United States, unless you're a publicly listed company or you have debt covenants from a bank, uh, for example, or your board of directors uh, require it, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, unless you don't have, if, if you don't have those three items, then there's no financial statement audit requirement, uh, no statutory audit requirement, right? But if you are publicly listed, if you do have bank debt covenants, if your board of directors just require that corporate governance of having financial statements audits, then then, um, then that, that would be the only two. Uh, uh, time that a financial statement uh, audit would be required. As Jugal mentioned, I think he called it the constitutions. We called it choice of entities. We talked about uh, LLCs, limited liability companies. We talked about C corporations. Uh, we talked about partnerships. Uh, those were the main uh, entities that we talked about. And depending on the goals of, of your business, which choice of entity works best, right? One of the starting points for an inbound transaction is, is generally a C-Corp. And I say starting point, but not always the, the, the best entity. There's many considerations to take in, in, into account. Uh, we talked about uh, the U.S.'s corporate income tax regime and individual income tax regime. Right now, there's a corporate income tax rate of 21%. Um, the Biden administration, which uh, President Joe Biden will uh, enter office on uh, tomorrow, January 20th is his inauguration date. There's a big, uh, a big celebration in Washington, D.C., although that's been tempered with some of the riots and the unprecedented capital um, uh, you know, storming by some of President Trump's supporters. Uh, so we, we, it's, it's a very much uh, unprecedented time here in the United States. There's going to be a transfer of power. The Democratic Party will now have Joe Biden in the White House. The Senate has uh, control 50-50 uh, uh, by Democrats, although that tiebreaker can be made by the Vice President, Kamala Harris, who is also a Democrat. And then the House of Representatives is also controlled by the Democrat Party, so we think that there's going to be substantial changes on the horizon, um, and, and those those changes generally will be an increase in tax, whether that's uh, a tax on the and, and and generally the proposal is for those that make over four hundred thousand U.S. dollars, there's going to be an increase in tax. The corporate income tax rate is proposed to go from twenty one percent to twenty eight percent. But we, we don't know w when that will happen. Um, you know, there are there are a lot of uncertainty right now, and that's unfortunate for businesses. Uh, but uh, I, I know that the Biden administration has an eye on tax policy, um, although they that we hope that that will be tempered with the economic destruction that has happened as a result of the pandemic uh, virus. We talked last time about uh, you know a U.S. trade or business. What that means, the U.S.'s um, the U.S.'s uh, worldwide system for taxing U.S. individuals. So U.S. individuals, U.S. corporations are taxed on their worldwide income. Uh, conversely, um, businesses that come here to the United States that are not U.S. corporations, not U.S. entities, are taxed on a territorial system. They're taxed on their U.S. trade or business profits, but not anything else. We talked about the, the uh, uh, effectively connected income, what that means. And lastly, we, we gave an overview of U.S. sales tax, right, which is somewhat equivalent to the GST or VAT regime, although not completely similar, right? We mentioned that U.S. sales tax is, is really imposed on the end consumer, unlike GST or VAT, which, which we understand to be imposed on every transaction in the supply chain. We talked about a, a landmark case called the Wayfair case that the, the U.S. Supreme Court decided in June of 2018. And, and you recall that prior to that case, um, companies were only required to collect and remit U.S. sales tax 
if they had a physical presence in the state. And, and where that may affect, you know, the, the listeners on this webcast um, is prior, you know, under the old rules, if a Indian company or a Hong Kong company or a Dubai company uh, or a Singapore company was selling product into the United States and they had no physical presence in the United States, that that company was not required to collect and remit U.S. sales tax because they had no physical presence in the state. But that changed with the Wayfair case. The Wayfair case held that if a, a remote company had no physical presence, but had an economic presence, and that economic presence uh, is now decided on a state by state basis, but the, the general rule is if, if they had an economic presence and that economic presence was defined to be approximately $100,000 of sales or turnover annually, or 200 transaction, that would cause that remote seller to collect and remit sales tax in that state. And so we have to look at those things. So uh, um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about US sales tax, especially for remote sellers that, that folks on this webcast may be interested in, but ho hopefully that gives you a, a good reminder of, of what we talked about in, in webinar one. Well, uh, you know, um, we started to talk about the payroll regime, payroll tax regime here in the United States. And let, let me give you a little bit of, of that. You know, if if, uh, you know, let's say an Indian company uh, decides to expand into the United States and they decide to hire employees. Uh, there is certain withholding that is required. And the, the three categories of withholding are on this slide. There would be federal income tax withholding on that employee. So it, that means that the employer acts as a withholding agent and remits uh, federal income tax withholding to the Inter Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, which is the U.S. Tax Authority. And so when an employee goes to file their individual income tax returns, they report their wages from their employer. And they also report the withholding that the employer has withheld on their behalf, the taxes that have been paid on their behalf. That's the federal income tax withholding. The second is commonly called the Federal Insurance Contribution Act, FICA for short. And within this category, there are two subcategories. There is what's called social security, and that is 6.2%. And the second cat subcategory is Medicare, and that's 1.45%. So if, if, if I'm an employee of a, of a, and here in the United States, and um, I make $100 on my paycheck, for example, my employer will withhold six dollars and twenty cents of social security and will hold and will withhold one dollar and forty five cents for medicare the purpose of which is is that when i retire that i will receive these monies back as a safety net and that's what social security is for so generally when i turn 65 years of age and i stop working and i retire i will get that that social security payment back made to me by the government as as uh, uh, so as so used as a safety net that the Medicare piece is related to health insurance that will be used to pay for my health care when I turn 65. So think of it as the U.S.'s uh, safety net system, but all employers are required to withhold that. The second the last category is this federal unemployment tax. This is a tax that is imposed and it's only imposed on employers. The, the first two were imposed on employees. This last one is only on employers. So it's a tax that is paid that goes into a federal unemployment tax insurance fund so that when employees lose their jobs due to layoffs or you know, a close of business, they can receive unemployment. And that, that's the point of this tax that's commonly abbreviated FUDA, Federal uh, Joel, Unemployment uh, Tax. Yeah. Jugal, you bet. 
Yeah, uh, yeah just uh, uh, one uh, query here. Uh, this future, whatever you have mentioned, two things here, whether it is uh, uh, applicable for even uh, the foreign employers or only US, US employers, that is one thing. And second, the reasons for uh, the employee leaving the company. I mean, those only covers uh, layoffs and uh, closure of business or even uh, for some other reasons as well, if the employee is leaving, still uh, future would be applicable for the employers. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, Gr great question. L let me repeat those questions for everyone in, in my own words, Jugal. The first question is, is it, it, what about an inbound company, a foreign company? You know, I'm using an Indian parent, for example. Are they subject to this federal unemployment tax? And, and, and to answer that, we have to look to the India-US treaty. And the question, it, and, and we have to answer the question, does the Indian parent, the, the Indian company, does it have permanent establishment, right? And the permanent establishment clause in the US-India treaty says, does the Indian company have a fixed place of business in the United States? And the fixed place of business is defined as an office, a factory, a mine, a quarry, a warehouse, uh, right? Those things, we ask ourselves those questions, yes or no. If the answer to, yet to, the, to the, that question is yes, then that Indian company has permanent establishment. And yes, it would be subject to this federal unemployment tax. But there's a, also a clause in the India-US treaty that says, notwithstanding that fixed presence, if the Indian's parents' only activities in the United States are preparatory type of activities or an ancillary type of activities, um, you know, performing market research as part of their initial expansion, um, you know, collecting information uh, about potential customers, uh, if there is just the storage of inventory and the fulfillment of inventory, if those preparatory or those ancillary functions are the only functions then that will not create permanent establishment, notwithstanding the, the first criteria that I mentioned, that is the fixed place of business, right? The office, the mine, the factory, the quarry, those things, right? So if, 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 the, if, the, que if the question or the answer to the question is, is that the Indian parent uh, or the foreign parent or, or the foreign company does not have permanent establishment in the United States, it will not be subject to these these, these taxes that we're talking about here. But if it does have permanent establishment, then the answer is yes, it will be. Uh, and then Jugal, remind me the second part of that question. Second part is the reason um, uh, the person leaving the, the company, if it's, if it's the, the future would be applicable only where the reasons being uh, layoffs and closure of business or uh, if for some other reasons as well, if a person is leaving and he's becoming unemployed, still the future would be applicable. So uh, are the reasons restricted from employers and to be very specific or even from the employees and also if there are some concerns, reason as he's leaving the job, the uh, future would be applicable. Yeah, yeah, very, very good question. And, and I don't, I'm not sure I know the answer to this. We may need to follow up on this. I, I think that an employee who is terminated both for for cause and not for cause those are those are terms of art here in the united states it, it means uh, if an employee is is uh terminated for cause meaning there's a there's a significant reason that employee is terminated for performance issues for uh you know for a a, a, a wrongful act right uh, i believe that they are still eligible for unemployment benefits from the government, regardless. So, you know, uh, an, an innocent employee who was who was terminated or laid off, not for lack of not for lack of performance, but just because the company was doing poorly or their division was doing poorly, right? And due to no fault of their own, is, is for sure uh, eligible for unemployment benefits. But I think also an employee that is terminated for cause is is also put, uh, potentially there. I think we I need to double check that, and I can we can confirm that at, at you know at our on our next call.
Surely, surely, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, let's let's keep going now. Okay, I, I mentioned earlier, right, that, that these payroll taxes, these FICA, the first bullet point was that first social security that was required to be withheld. It's required to be held on every dollar up to payment of $142,800 of wages in 2021. That's the social security. That's the safety net that employees receive after they turn 65 or they retire. The this, this second bullet point here is the Medicare tax. That's the tax uh, that um, is withheld from employees. That's the 1.45%. Um, there is no cap on that. No matter what your salaries or wages are, that 1.45% will be withheld. And an, ad an additional 0.9% will be withheld if your wages are greater than $200,000. Now, keep in mind that employers are required to match both of this. So the, the employees get you know 6.2% and 1.45% withheld from their paychecks, but the employer must match that on top of that. So in, in that case, if an employer pays an, an employee $100,000, that's that is obviously a $100,000 cost, but they're, they are going to also have to pay that 7.65% also. So now an employer who plays an employee $100,000, their cost is not $100,000, it's $107,000 and change due to, to matching these two payroll taxes commonly called FICA. Now the food tax on an employer ranges between 0.6% and 6% depending on an employer's track record with unemployment, right? If there's, uh, you know, many, if there's many layoffs or if there is things like that, uh, or the industry, it, the, the government comes up with that range between the 0.6 and the 6%. Let's keep going here. Okay, you know, the, the employers must withhold, they need to make timely deposits and file quarterly and annual uh, employment tax returns. And these are the, those forms of that. And also here in the United States, all employees are very familiar with what's called a W-2. Employees, employers issue a W-2 to all of their employers, employees at the end of the year. And it reports the, the earnings and wages of the employee. And that is also filed with the internal revenue system. So I get a W-2 at the end of the year, I report it on my tax return, and it says Joe Hillstead made you know, $100,000 in 2020, and will be taxed on that. And that W-2 is also filed with the IRS. And so when I file my individual tax return, the IRS matches it with what I reported to what they received and said, okay, Joe Hillstead you know, correctly reported it, it agrees to what we received, and there, there seems to be no, no issues there. Now, let, let's, uh, you know, Jugal brought up this question. I want to hit on this, this bullet point. Well, what about, you know, employees or, or, or individuals, for example, that travel to the United States and uh, they're performing services here in the United States? Uh, are, are they subject to U.S. income tax? And so the question is, it depends. If they are from a country where there is a treaty in place, right, for in India and the United States, for example, there is a treaty in place, and there's a provision under uh, uh, the Dependent Personal Service Clause of the U.S.-India Treaty. And that clause in the treaty says that if an, if an Indian individual, for example, comes to the United States, and his, his time in the United States does not exceed 183 days, and his, compensa his or her compensation is made by an employer that is not a resident in the United States, let's say it's an Indian entity, and that compensation is not creating 
or that individual is not creating that permanent establishment that I mentioned earlier, right? That fixed place of business, the office, the warehouse, the mine, right? Those things, if that does not create permanent establishment, then the, the, the wages paid to that Indian individual will not be subject to US individual income tax. So I, I hope that's clear. So if there's any questions on that, please let me know. You know, if for other countries, we need to look to the treaty. And, and usually the treaty is gonna have similar provisions of the Indian US tax treaty, right? Uh, many of the US tax treaties are based on a model UN treaty in that situation are, are very similar. Although we always need to look at each individual treaty because they are all separately negotiated there. If we don't have the protection of the treaty, we look to US tax law to determine if the activities of that individual from a foreign country rise to the level such the, the, the US can tax it. And with no treaty in place, the, 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 the lesser, uh, we just, uh, um, those activities are going to be um, much more susceptible to U.S. income tax. Unfortunately, at least in the in in in, in the case of India, we have that that treaty. I think, in, in the interest of time, that's that, that's what I really wanted to cover. Yes, uh, Joe, um, good that you covered this point. Um, as I as I said in the in, in the beginning as well, one of the specific point was relating to this. So. Uh, maybe, uh, as I said, in the next session, we can have uh, dwell more on this uh, based on a case study, specific case study, but uh, you have given a, a good info here as, uh, as well. Yeah, yes. Yeah, good, good point, Jugal. Jugal wanted us to bring this up, and I think we're going to spend more time on it on webinar number three. And, and, and right, he, the, the example that Jugal mentioned would be not only employees coming from, you know, uh, from India, but also entrepreneurs, right? And, and along with that, you know, tell us a little bit about the immigration landscape, right? The type of visas that are available, whether that, that'd be an investor of visa or, you know, or an employee, you know, um, an employee type of visa and things like that. So we, we plan to cover that in webinar three, uh, which we will do. So uh, be ready for that. We hope to expand on, on that situation. Okay. Uh, you know, without the treaty protection, there is de minimis uh, amounts for uh, federal income tax exemption, right? So this would be for individuals that come from a country where there is not a treaty. Um, and, you know, if, the, if there is amounts paid less than $3,000 and visits less than 90 days, then, then those items will not, th that compensation will not be subject to US income tax. Um, and it, as we mentioned before, the treaty threshold gives, uh, allows much more activity uh, and, and that individual will not be subject to US income tax. So we need to, to double check that. All right, let, let's keep going. I wanted to cover transfer pricing. This is a, this is a hot topic and a hot issue, especially, you know, given the international commerce and, uh, you know, uh, given the OECD rules, OEDC, OECD stands for the Organization for Eco Economic Cooperation and Development that, I, you know, I believe that India, for example, um, you know, has, has entered into, the United States has, has agreed to most provision of the OECD BEPS initiative that has been put forward. Um, and, and so any, anyway, wanted to give you an, uh, um, an overview of the US transfer pricing landscape. And, and, and in short, right, transfer pricing is the price that is charged on any, any, any intercompany transaction, right? So in, in short, anytime there's a related party transaction among entities, and individuals transfer pricing or rules apply. This may be, be this can be between international cross border, or it can be between interstate entities, right? So if I've got a in a U.S. Cor a Utah corporation um, performing business in Utah, 
and I've got a, a California subsidiary that's performing business in California. Transfer pricing also applies between the states. It's not only between India and the United States or the United States and Canada or Hong Kong in the United States or, or, or uh, the United Arab Emirates, for example. And, you know, uh, over the, 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 the concept is foreign companies doing business in the, in the United States may not shift profits to the foreign parent to avoid taxes. Uh, and we use the arm's length standard here in the United States, I think similar to the OECD principles. Um, you know, transfer pricing occurs when the foreign parent charges US subsidiaries unreasonably high prices for goods and services to move pre-tax money overseas, and the IR, this is a this is a very much a very uh, a very hot topic, and the IRS is auditing more and more inbound companies, and the focus for them a lot is focusing on financing transactions, you know, complex financing transactions, and uh, and also intangible transactions, licensing of intellectual property. Um, so th those are the things that, uh, you know, that, that the IRS is definitely looking out for. You know, th this not next, uh, you know, this next example is, for example, if we have an India company that owns the U.S. subsidiary and, you know, what are some some of the intercompany transactions that may be applicable? Well, you know, the Indian company could sell inventory, right? In the U.S., we sometimes call that widgets or stock, right? India company sells inventory to the U.S. subsidiary or the Indian company licensed software that it has developed to the U.S. subsidiary or the, in the Indian company has collection staff that are trying to collect accounts receivable on behalf of the United States. Or maybe there are executives that are performing strategy or general management, or we've got accounting staff in India that's performing uh, the monthly closes of the financial statements or uh, HR or legal, whatever, you know, whatever those services are. The Indian parent may loan money to the U.S. subsidiary, right? All of these are intercompany transactions. And as a result, the U.S. subsidiary may be paying a royalty. It may be paying a service fee. It may be paying rent. It may be paying interest on those loans, right? We look at every single one of these transactions to make sure that they're, they are arm's length. Uh, the, the rules, there is one code section, and I, and I hate to bring this up, but it's very important because this is the, this is the code section that governs transfer pricing. It's section 482 and the 482 regulations promulgated under section 482. In the United States, what we, we really consider, the factors that we consider is that the functions performed by each of the parties to the transaction, right? Going back to, to, to the example, right? What functions are performed by the Indian company? What functions are performed by the US subsidiary? What risks are borne by the US subsidiary, right? Uh, those risks could be you know, market risk, collection risk, interest rate risk, um, you know, you, those are the risks. Which, which company uh, bear, bears those risks? What are the contractual terms? What are the economic conditions and market looks like in both, uh, you know, both markets? And what are the natures of the, what's the nature of the transaction? You know, and, and George, I, I- George, just one thing uh, in, the, in, in the previous slide, uh, I could see the factors which are required to be considered for the purpose of strong surprising. So uh, just I was surprised to uh, not see the assets employed, whether that is not a principal criteria there in you, because when you when you consider uh, Indian trans surprising laws, the functions performed uh, along with risk and the assets which are employed uh, for that particular transactions by both the entities, be it the, the Indian parent or the foreign or the US subsidiary. So I could not see that. So whether um, the assets uh, do not have that uh, great uh, importance when it comes to transfer pricing, or it's just that uh, these were the top five and assets needs to uh, assets also needs to be considered. How is it, uh, Joe? No, Jugo, good catch. Very good catch. No, absolutely. Assets employed is definitely one of the factors 
right? And and that was just uh, uh, an, an oversight on my part. Absolutely, yes, we are, are very integral for transfer pricing methods. We look to see what valuable, you know, uh, valuable assets are held by either one of the parties, whether that's valuable intellectual property or, or you know, capital, uh, capital intensive assets, whatever the case may be. So, yeah, good, very good catch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Please, please continue. Sorry. So I was going on to our transfer pricing methods, right? And I, I don't want to get into the weeds on these, but all I want, I want to show that, you know, the comparable uncontrolled price method, resale price method, cost plus method, these are transactional based methods, right? Do we have similar transactions to an uncontrolled party? That's what these three are versus profit based method. We look to the profits of an uncontrolled party to see if they are similar. And we look to the functions, especially the functions, but the functions, risks and assets of comparable companies in the last two, the comparable profits method and the profit split method. Here in the United States, I use the CPM the comparable pro, uh, profits method. And, and, and Jugal, I believe, and, and maybe I'm interested in your comments here, but for for you, the CPM is equivalent equivalent to the transactional net margin method. Is, yes, is that yes, Joe. yes, Joe, you are, you are absolutely correct. And here as well in India, uh, the method which is predominantly used uh, for the purpose of transfer pricing, and again, from the authorities' perspective as well, uh, they also prefer TNMM, that is uh, the comparable profits method, uh, as you mentioned. And they do always do an additional check with TNMM here to to confirm the arm's length pricing. So uh, I guess even though the terminology is different, but um, I guess the perspective are, uh, are similar when it comes to justifying the transaction. Yes. Yeah. Great. That's good to know. Yep. So exactly. TNMM, transactional net margin method, very similar or it, it is it's the exact same thing of our comparable profits method. That's what you, we use frequently in determining the best method to evaluate an arm's length transaction. Uh, I, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to to skip this one. Well, well, I'm just going to touch on it briefly. The comparable profits method in the United States require us to, number one, determine the tested party. Which one of the entities is the simpler party, right? Which one does not have valuable assets? Which one is a limited risk distributor or a strict risk distributor? Um, you know, that's number one. Second is we then search for comparable companies that have similar functions uh, to the tested party. Then we select a financial ratio called a profit level indicator. And then we develop an arm's length range of profit level indicators based on the financial data of the comparable companies. That's number four. And then number five, we construct an arm's length range of comparable operating, operating profits using the, the, the PLI or the, the financial ratio that we've selected. We make any adjustments for comparability if needed. And then lastly, we determine if the tested party is within the arm's length range that we've constructed using this search for comparable companies. That's, that's a general overview of how we use the comparable profits method, which I think is very equivalent to that transactional net margin method that, that you've all uh, what about intercompany services, right? I, I, I mentioned, you know, let, let's say, for example, if, if we've got a U.S. head office, which has three subsidiaries, it's got an India subsidiary, a Hong Kong subsidiary, it's got a U.K. subsidiary, and, and the U.S. head office is performing strategic management, uh, human resource services, credit services, risk, legal administration, or it could be providing technical services, developmental services, uh, contract manufacturing services or call centers, right? We would charge those to our subsidiaries using probably a cost or a cost plus type of profit level indicator here. 
very, very common here for U.S. multinationals that expanded abroad. I'm sure it's very similar to where you're at, where you've got Indian multinationals that have expanded into the United States and, and, and a management fee or a management service fee needs to be charged to the U.S. subsidiary. You know, we find very often that there is intangible property um, either, uh, you know, and here in the example, I've got U.S. parent that does research and development. It's developed very valuable intellectual property, and that intellectual property could be in the form of know-how or patents or processes or formulas or copyrights. It could be marketing intangibles like trademarks, trade names, brand names. Uh, it could be customer relationships, customer lists. It could be a workforce in place or a sales force in place, right? And, and the Indian subsidiary is using that intellectual property, that know-how, that, that, that patent, that trademark name, right? And we need to come up with an arm's length price on the licensing of that that intellectual property, right? That's, and, and, and I, as I mentioned early, the United States says IRS Internal Revenue Service is very keen on this. So we're more, we're very much more likely to be audited in this situation where we've got intellectual property transactions because of bad actors in the past that have, uh, you know, taken, taken advantages or have been very aggressive uh, in order to shift profits to countries where uh, the tax rate was lower, you know. And, and for the United States, as, as a reminder, right, before the Trump era, the corporate income tax rate was 35%, but now it's 21%. And so we are very much in line with the OECD nations, but we'll see what happens if that rate goes up to 28%. Now, I, I want to keep in mind two important penalties. And there is a 20% penalty for uh, for transfer pricing uh, penalties if there are if the trans if the, there is 200% or more of the arm's length amount or 50% or less of the arm's length amount. And that uh, that penalty it it increases um, to it, it, it increases if taxable income exceeds five million dollars or ten percent of the taxpayer's gross receipts. Now that that penalty significantly increases. It goes up to four hundred percent of the arm's length amount or twenty five percent or or less of the arm's length amount. Uh, and that you know that forty percent penalty. Um, we look at that if there's taxable income exceeds $200 million or 20% of taxpayers' gross receipts. So the overarching concept here is that the U.S. has significant penalties if transfer pricing rules are not met with. And so we want to avoid that at all costs. You know, it's 20% if, 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 if the transfer pricing penalty is egregious, it goes up to 40% of tax. Uh, Joe, here one uh, concern whether again, uh, if uh, I could see the penalty for uh, uh, not uh, or say the tax underpayment, but uh, are there any specific penalties for uh, transfer pricing study not being done? Say it was applicable and it is not being done. So whether it will fall in the bracket of 50% uh, or less, whether it will fall in that bracket or uh, the penalty is not being determined for that. Yeah, yeah, very, very good question. So the rule, Jugal, here in the United States is that you need to have contemporaneous documentation documenting your intercompany transaction. And what that means, contemporaneous documentation means, is that you need to have documentation in place when you file the, the income tax return. You know, so when, when we go back to my example here, right, we had all these intercompany transactions, right? The U.S. subsidiary will file a corporate income tax return. And, and on the day it files it, it should have a do, the documentation in place documenting each one of these intercompany transactions and demonstrating that each one of them were at arm's length and, and using U.S. transfer pricing principles. Now, that transfer pricing study is not filed with the IRS. It is maintained on file with the U.S. subsidiary. 
And if the IRS selects the U.S. subsidiary for audit, it will say, we will give you 30 days to produce your contemporary document, contemporaneous documentation. And so if, if, if the U.S. subsidiary has been, has been negligent and did not provide the documentation at the time the return is filed, it has 30 days to complete that. And as you know, Jugal, pr providing a, a transfer pricing study, especially for complex transactions within 30 days is very, very difficult. So we recommend to all our clients to have the transfer pricing study or the transfer pricing benchmarking analysis or whatever the documentation is that it be in place by the filing of the, the tax return by the U.S. subsidiary. Did, did that make sense? Yes. Uh, I mean, I got the idea, but uh, I was just wondering what would be the penalty if that is not being mentioned even after the 30 days or that the authorities come to know about it, what would be the penalty which would be charged? Yeah. Because you're in, you're in uh, India, if you see, we have uh, a 2% of the transaction amount. Of, okay. uh, if the transparency study is not applicable and if say the transaction under consideration is 100 crores, uh, the penalty itself would be but two crores. So any, any such specific penalty when it comes to US, if no transferring study is being done or the documentation is not being maintained? Yes, it would be it would be these penalties, Jugal. It would be 20% of the tax underpayment. Uh, if it's egregious, it would be 40% of the tax underpayment. That would be the penalty for not. Now, now if if you have your documentation in place and you had it contemporaneously and you provide it to the tax authorities and you meet all the criteria, which is this on this slide, then, then the IRS cannot charge these penalties, this 20% and 40%. Does, does that make sense? Yes, uh, yes, 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 Joe, yeah. Okay, great, great. So so these, you know, in the interest of time, we're, we're 45 minutes into this and, and we've got much more to cover. Uh, in fact, I wanna get to uh, Sierra's piece on the uh, on the coronavirus act, but I just wanted you to let you know that there are certain requirements that U.S. transfer pricing studies have, and you can you can read these, and and we hope to send out this deck to everyone on this call later on uh, to so they know what is included in the transfer pricing documentation studies. Uh, this is just a continuation on that. Let me go here. Uh, of course, the U.S. follows the country by country reporting, right? That's the, the matrix. That's the spreadsheet that gives all of the subsidiaries and gives all of the, you know, the, the profit, the revenue, some of the, the functions, risks and assets and things like that. And, and then there's some additional forms that we file with the U.S. tax return. Um, I, I do want to bring up red flags here in the United States, right? The transfer pricing red flags here in the United States. Number one is that, that there is no intercompany agreement. There's not an intercompany contract in place and there is not a written transfer pricing policy. That's a red flag. Number two, there's not transfer pricing documentation. That's always a red flag for the IRS. Number three is that the entity's profit is too high or too low or too much losses that don't indicate arm's length transactions. And then lastly, the IRS is always looking at complex transactions, bundled products, cost sharing, IP migration, transfer of intellectual property uh, to low cost jurisdictions, especially to haven countries like the Cayman Islands, Bahamas, Bermudas, you know, Caribbean island nations that, that have little functions there. Those are always red flags to the, to the US IRS. Okay, in, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip some of the, the, the guilty, the beat the CFCs, and I want Sierra to talk about what's happening with the coronavirus, what's happening with legislation here in the United States, and, and you know, what hopefully you guys can, can glean from that. Sierra, do you want me to fast forward to the CARES Act? Sure, Joe. 
I think. Mm -hmm. Go back. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the CARES Act was passed in March on March 27th of 2020 by President Trump. Um, it stands for the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. And its purpose was to assist individuals and businesses impacted by economic effects of this pandemic. Joe, do you want me to go? Yeah, why, go. Why, why don't you take control, Sierra, if you can. Okay, perfect. So the CARES Act had a few um, key tax relief measures for businesses. One of these was the five-year NOL carryback. Another was the Section 63J interest deduction limitation that got changed. And the rest have to do with the PPP program, um, which includes payroll tax relief and credits for employers who retain employees. So you know what the NOL stands for? NOL, net operating loss. Sorry. Okay, okay, okay fine, fine. Okay, so for the five-year net operating loss carrybacks, the CARES Act allows a net operating loss generated in the tax years 2018, 2019, and 2020 to now be carried back for five years. And then you can also elect to carry back the NOL to offset income earned during the previous five tax years. So this five-year carryback is optional. It's not required. So there's actually a spot on the 2020 returns to mark if you don't want to make this election. But the five-year NOL carryback temporarily removes this 80% taxable income limitation that has been here since the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So now an NOL can fully offset income before January 1st of 2021. Yeah. And, and, and I just wanted to comment here, Sierra, you know, I, I think for the for the listeners on this this webinar, you know, the 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 concept here that the u.s government they recognized the economic impact that the coronavirus was having to businesses and you know as we mentioned in webinar one um it, it has disproportionately affected small businesses here in the united states and we expect many small businesses restaurants movie theaters hotels to to sustain significant losses as a result of the coronavirus and so that, you know, as Sierra mentioned, these losses, you know, generally would only be able to be carried back two years to get a refund if a business paid tax in those prior two years. We, the, the government wanted to expand that, allow businesses to carry it back up to five years so that they could get refunds on taxes that they paid in prior profitable years, you know, when the economy here in the United States has been generally ramping up. Um, but but now, uh, and so this is a measure again to help small small businesses. So. Yeah, and I'll kind of go into that more when I talk about the payroll protection program. But for this temporary net operating loss relief, the carryback must be used completely for all of the available tax years where there's income available to be offset. And the carrybacks can also interact with other tax attributes of multinational companies. So businesses who may have reported some other tax attributes in the prior five years that this NOL would be car being carried back to would need to do some additional planning. So a few of these other provisions that could be affected with the carryback are foreign tax credits, foreign tax redeterminations, and this base erosion anti-abuse tax, which Joe was going to cover, but we didn't get there. So another um, key element of this CARES Act is the limitation on the deduction for the interest, interest expense. So through the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, the limitation to the taxpayer's business interest income was 30% of adjusted taxable income. And through the CARES Act, they increased the 30% adjusted taxable income limitation to 50% just for the tax years 2019 and 2020. Yeah, and, and, and just a comment there, Sierra. I, I think for, you know, we, we talked, you know, in the example that I gave where if we've got an Indian parent that owns a U.S. subsidiary and the Indian parent loans money to the U.S. subsidiary to expand here in the United States, and you know there needs to be an arm's length charge on that interest expense but the the u.s entity can deduct that interest expense uh to the extent of this limitation that sierra is giving 
where it used to be basically 30% of your taxable income, meaning that was the amount of interest that you could deduct. But given that, they increased it, that limitation to 50%, meaning they made it, made it much more liberal. And, and so that, that has some benefits then to inbound companies expanding, especially if they fund U.S. operations th through debt. Thanks, Daryl. Um, the next key element of this CARES Act included the Payroll Pro Protection Program. Um, and this is a revenue replacement program for businesses through giving out forgivable loans. And it's administered by the Small Business Administration known as the SBA. Um, its goals were to help small businesses pay for near-term near operating expenses during the worst of this crisis and to provide incentive for employers to keep their employees on the payroll. So the first round of the PPP opened in April of 2020 and ended in August, but they've just reopened the second round of, the, of these loans, which I'll talk about next. But the PPP allows small businesses to take loans up to $10 million, which they can use to defer the costs of keeping their employees, adding employees, and paying certain other expenses. Some of these other covered expenses include salaries and wages, which for a sole proprietor or independent contractor, someone who's self-employed, this includes wages, commissions, incomes, and net earnings from self-employment, but it's capped at $100,000 on an annualized basis for each employee. Some other covered expenses include health benefits, retirement benefits, state and local taxes, and then vacation, family, medical, or sick leave. A few stipulations of the PPP program um, include that, that, like I just mentioned, the payroll costs can't include annual compensation over $100,000 for each individual employee. Um, the loan amount is limited to the lesser of the total average monthly payroll costs for the prior 12 months, multiplied by 2.5 or $10 million, which is the maximum loan amount. So if your payroll costs for the prior 12 months times by 2.5 would be less than the 10 million, you're limited to that 10 million amount. Um, most businesses end up borrowing up to roughly 10 weeks worth of payroll expenses. And these businesses must certify that the loan will be used to support ongoing operations and to retain workers or maintain their payroll costs. So you do have to provide documentation to be forgiven for these loans. And, and, and Sierra, you know, for, for our audience, um, which are, are, are generally located outside the United States, can, can um, you know, let's say if we had an Indian parent with a U.S. subsidiary, could that U.S. subsidiary still apply for PPP benefits, even though it's owned by a foreign owner? I believe they can, but we can look into that and give them more yeah. guidance next week. Yeah. I, I, think, I think the answer is, is yes, Sierra. I think we do need to double check that just to make sure. But right, I think the point is, is that for those that have expanded in the U.S., we want to make sure that this program is is looked at so that they can get these forgivable loans so that right. they can keep their U.S. business going during this, this difficult economic time. Yeah, even just to add what uh, Joe said, uh, even I, I presume uh, it has to be because maybe uh, from rather than seeing who is the owner of that company, the business happened there even before before pandemic and um, business got expanded there and also um, there was revenue for the government so i i presume the the u.s government would not differentiate uh, between a a, a a foreign owned company or a u.s based company as far as uh, these measures or these reliefs are concerned i i think that's correct you um the and the point is is right maybe may, uh, it, it's to make sure that employees stay on payroll and are not laid off and that's the reason for these forgivable loans so you know if if an indian parent had expanded in the us and hired employees they were just as, fect, uh, as affected by the pandemic as as a us owned company 
right? And so we want to make sure that their employees can stay on payroll during this pandemic. So I, I, I think that that's correct, but we'll we'll confirm it uh, next okay. week. Okay, okay, Joe. Yes, Sierra. Great. So yeah, for the forgiveness of these loans, the eligibility is an eight week period following the date that the loan was originated. And the forgiveness amount is then proportionately reduced if the average number of employees gets reduced during that covered period as you compare the covered period to the same period the prior year in 2019. So the Paycheck Protection Program went from April to August of 2020, but it reopened for first draw loans the, the week of January 11th, 2021. And then they're going to begin accepting applications. Well, they just started beginning applica beginning to accept applications for the second draw PPP loans on January 13th. So these second draw PPP loans are for people who have already received a PPP loan the first round. So these have the same general loan terms as their first loan. And for both people applying for the first draw loans and the second draw loans, these are to fund costs like payroll costs, pay mortgage interest, rent, utilities, worker protection costs related to COVID, uninsured property damage costs caused by looting or vandalism during 2020. And then they also cover certain supplier costs for operations. So those who qualify for first draw PPP loans can be sole proprietors, independent contractors, self-employed people, any small business that meets the SBA size standards, uh, any business, nonprofit, veterans organizations with more than 500 employees or that meet the SBA industry size standard. And then any business with a code that begins with 72, so this is food service industries, um, that have more than one physical location and employ less than five people per location or also can qualify for this loan. And, and uh, Sierra, um, I think the, the last point that I want to bring up is the new round of PPP loans, which are forgivable. Um, it, the, the employee threshold is 300 now. Okay, I saw 500, so that's good to know. And, and, and Sierra, we, uh, we are now at 7.30 hour time, which I believe is 8 o'clock in, in India. So why, why don't we pause there, uh, turn it over back to Jugal for, for any questions. Uh, I mean, uh, Sierra, anything, anything more left on the, uh, on the COVID uh, impact and relief or this is what if, if we have, we can, I mean, we can extend to five ten more minutes uh, if you can take five minutes of this and maybe in the next five minutes i wanted joe to touch upon uh, uh, on the beat as well as uh, the guilty maybe we can deliberate on that uh, in 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 the in the in the third session but maybe just touch base as to what exactly those means uh expanded version of that can have we can have it in in, in the third session <laughs> Okay, Joe, do you want me to do a super quick? I think there's only three slides left. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great, yep. Okay, perfect. So for the first draw PPP loans, the SBA forgives these loans if all of the employee retention criteria is met and the funds are used for the eligible expenses that I've um, talked about. The interest rate for these loans is 1%. Um, loans issued before June 5th of 2020 have a maturity of two years while loans after that date have a maturity of five years. And then for the second draw PPP loans, people who qualify are people who previously received a PPP loan and will or have used the full amount for the authorized uses, people who don't have more than 300 employees, and those who can demonstrate that at least 25, there's been at least a 25% reduction in gross receipts between comparable quarters in 2019 and 2020. And then lastly, the second draw PPP loans, the maximum loan amount is 2.5 times the monthly average 2019 or 2020 payroll costs up to a maximum of 2 million. And then borrowers in the accommodation and food services industries, the maximum amount is 3.5 times their average monthly payroll costs, but still up to that 2 million amount. Joe, do you want to go back and cover yeah, I, I think 
Uh, I, I think that uh, both guilty and beat, I, I'd like to cover in next session in, in detail. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I think it, it, it's, it's too difficult of a concept to just uh, touch on. So if that's okay with you, I think that's what, what yeah, we can yeah, talk that, that's totally That's totally fine. Maybe as, as, as I mentioned in the start, uh, uh, the, uh, the spillovers for today's uh, session, from today's session, uh, couple of, or I think so three concepts that and uh, uh, specifics about uh, residential status again on our WhatsApp group I've received one uh, uh, not the query but a request that in the next session maybe touching upon the social security uh, uh, benefits more and uh, especially when when a foreigner comes to US and work so how how uh, the contributions will work and uh, what, what are the implications relating to that so uh, even we can touch base on that as well uh, in our next session. That's, that sounds great. Yep. Yep. So um, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Sierra, for this uh, wonderful session. Uh, again, uh, uh, needless to say, uh, uh, we, we, we learned a lot uh, in, in, this, in this one hour about transfer pricing, about payroll taxes, and more importantly, uh, about the COVID impact and reliefs uh, provided by the U.S. government. Uh, as discussed, we'll again have a session uh, on uh, 26th of January uh, on the same time at 7 p.m. And we'll try to cover the pending aspects of today and um, uh, more on the residential status, uh, the social security part, and also a few, few practical case studies. So thank you, Joe, and thank you, Sierra, once again, um, and uh, have a great day ahead. Thanks, Jugal. Thanks, everyone. See you next, next week. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Sierra. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.